So I'm here with Maddox, uh, and it's funny because, you know, just before this, I was asking you, uh, do you prefer to go by George or do you prefer Maddox? Because I, I joked that you're sort of like this rap-like figure, and I was expecting you to say George, but no, you just jumped right in there. You're like, I'm good with Maddox. <laughs> Let's run with that. Either one's fine, but yeah, I, I think Maddox, um, I mean, just depends on the, on the, the mm -hmm. type of interview you want to do. If you want to do a Maddox style interview, it'll be more of the Maddox personality versus George is like a real person. So yeah. there's that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's crazy because with Maddox, you were sort of, you know, what the internet is today. You were one of the, you know, original, you know, like the punk rock bands that developed in, into what it is today. Everyone knows Joe Rogan and you look at the early, you know, episodes that he was doing, it was sort of your template of just, you know, going online doing stuff that entertains yourself for your friends and letting it grow organically. Uh, and, and, you know, you doing that without any advertising blew up to, you know, millions of, of, you know, viewers every day coming to your site, which I mean, definitely has to blow up your ego. That has to be super exciting. Uh, that's making an assumption. I didn't already have an ego. So, uh... <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a wild ride, but I think you hit on a very important aspect of all of this, which is I am entertaining myself, mm -hmm. uh, first and foremost. So whatever I find entertaining, I just do. And then if other people find entertaining, great. Uh, they come along for the ride. And usually that seems to be the case. I'm, but I think that's where the, the, uh, genesis of any true art that, is worth a damn comes from is somebody's making something that they like. Yeah. And before I even jump into, you know, cause I, I emailed you some questions about some movies that I'd love to talk with you about. Uh, there was something that popped up, you know, I, I obviously was reading your site, following your site since the early two thousands when I first discovered it and you've never had any advertising. And, and Correct, one of your yeah. arguments is once you get advertisers, it gives an opportunity for them to censor you by pulling you know, that advertising revenue. And that for me, because I'm, I'm a firm believer, I'm actually doing a documentary now on the importance of artistic expression. Uh, you know, the ability to be able to put out what you want and not be afraid of sort of, well, you know, is Pepsi going to pull the plug on, you know, the, the annoying banner that makes it forever to load my site. It, it impacts how you create and you've never had any sort of, you know, obstacles on that front, you know, Correct. Yeah. The, the, so this was a grand experiment. I started over 20 years ago when I first started my website, which is, and I've given up a lot of money that I could have made. Like probably at one point, um, I put a, I put a small ad on an experimental website that I linked to a long time ago. And based on like the weekly estimate that I made, I could have made like $10,000 a month, like way back in the day. Um, just off of one small banner if I put it on there, let alone my hundreds of pages. So yeah, I've given up a lot of money for this experiment, but I do believe that it does free you up to write and create without any constraints. And people say all the time I get this criticism. It's like, well, if you don't want to censor yourself, just don't censor yourself. So, but in reality, that's not how it works. Look at YouTube. Like when YouTube wasn't, a monetized platform and creators could just create whatever they wanted. There was all sorts of crap. YouTube was an edgy place. Now, if you use a, 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 a curse word in the first 10 seconds of your video, your video might get demonetized or ranked as adult only. So most creators don't do that. And most creators will censor, you know, they'll put bleeps and, and blurs and things like that in their videos. They play by the rules. I and mean, that's including myself. I play by the rules on YouTube. You have to. You have no choice because you will get not only demonetized, but then you will get uh, hidden from the algorithms. You won't be served up anymore. So the entire internet has slowly come around to my point of view that I started 20 years ago. And I said, if you want free expression, you need to pay for it yourself. And you can't rely on advertisers because they have a certain agenda. They don't want to associate their content with what you necessarily have to say. Yeah. And eventually you know, the growth of your website led to a book deal. You have two books, The Alphabet of Manliness. You wrote a book about how you're better than everyone's children, which, you know, right. has received little debate from, from my end. Uh, obviously, you're going to have to deal, 
you know, that's a different situation. You're dealing with a publishing company. Did, did they sort of let you be you or was it we want your audience, but we want you to play by our rules? Yeah, the publisher was great, actually. That was something I had a lot of trepidation for before I got a book deal. But the publisher has been very uh, hands off. They, you basically write whatever you want. They've, I've never gotten any pushback from any publisher on any content in the book other than things that they think will work or not work or whatever. The editor is just looking to produce a tight product. He's not looking to um, you know, shape your, your message or your vision or anything like that uh, in particular. And I, I wrote a third book too. The, the third one is called Fuck Whales. And that one came out <laughs> yes. uh, yeah, two and a half, three years ago, yeah. So fuck whales. They still, they still, they still don't have their movement yet, but it's coming soon, which should should actually <laughs> help help numbers. Uh, it's kind of funny. I, I for the first twenty years of my writing. So speaking of, uh, just this was my own personal, I guess, uh, rule that I set for myself. I never used the F word in my writing for twenty years, and not for any particular reason other than I wanted to force myself to be more creative. I wanted to come up with a better word or a more creative way to say what I was trying to say. And it really forced me to really be creative. And then I came out with fuck whales and every single chapter starts with the F word. <laughs> so it's kind of a, a, kind of a full circle with that philosophy. Uh, and it was a really a lot of fun to write. I can imagine, you know, just, having never cursed to finally having that book it's like i'm just gonna get it all out it's sort of like that scene in 25th hour where it's like fuck you fuck you fuck you you know yeah just just yeah, getting it out that. but even in spite of that you can tell in my writing it's not a common word that shows up like it shows up in it and it's in the header of every single title but that's about it it's not like you know all throughout my writing yeah, I mean, in, in terms of the style of your writing, it's it's obviously you're just trying to entertain yourself and your friends, but like the reason I wanted to talk to you, I mean, I talk with everyone about movies, but I wanted to talk with you about movies is because you do a lot of reviews. Every time certain movies come out, you make sure to to do something on it. You put out lists. And with a lot of subjects, you'll write an article where it's like, okay, this is a silly, stupid subject. Let me make fun of it. But when you write about movies, it's sort of like, okay, I'm going to make fun of this movie. But you get a little more passionate about it because it, it, it seems like a subject where, where you actually care. I remember you writing about, and this was years ago, the day after tomorrow when it came out, the ridiculousness of it. Uh, and, and you know, it, it sort of seems like you take it almost personally when a movie is bad or when you don't like a movie. <laughs> uh, and, and you know, that's why I sort of wanted to pick your brain about, you know, what kinds of movies you like, what kinds of movies you don't like. Uh, you know, first, as someone who's a humorist, you know, are you more so inspired by comedies or is your type of humor driven by, you know, the the sort of bad funny movie, a movie that intends to be serious, but just misfires on all cylinders and ends up being hilarious? Yeah, definitely the latter. Something. So I, I uh, you know, we talked about this a little bit in, in the email exchange, but um, the the type of humor, I think that I mean, a, a really good comedy is unimpeachable. You can find a lot of great comedies, a lot of great jokes, a lot of great scripted content. But there's also a type of humor that comes about where it's the Venn diagram intersection of bad acting, bad writing, and bad cinematography. And when all three of those kind of meet in the middle, you sometimes have this absurd style of humor that is unintended and very difficult to replicate. Um, you know, as, as funny as as a good scripted joke is, there's there's a there's a type of humor that you can't quite capture. Like you're going to a UN speech where they're going to do a peace accord, and uh, you know the guy has a booger on his face by accident. Like he, it just comes out. Like something like that happens in real life, and it's so funny because it's so unexpected, it's so absurd. And I think a lot of humor comes from the juxtaposition of what you expect and something unexpected happening, and. Uh, that's exactly what happens with really bad films. And I think that's, that's a, you know, that's inspiring. I think that's a lot of fun because it's absurd and I like absurd humor. Yeah. It's also a form of sort of like punching down, which I think is a great form of humor. You know, I, I hate the whole concept where good comedy is only punching up. I think punching down is hilarious. And when you're watching a movie that's intended to sort of be so serious, but it's so bad, it lets you as the audience sort of like mock you know, the people involved, it's like a punching down joke just by watching it. And, you know, the, the 
king comedy of that is obviously the room and i think that's why it's it's so you know lasting in its effect because everyone who watches it is automatically better than the movie it, it just gives <laughs> you the sort of like little rise or like i'm gonna walk out of that that movie theater and i'm gonna conquer the day because i didn't make the room well there's a there's a formula in my mind and this is my favorite type of character not just in movies but in real life i have a friend like this it's the combination of arrogance and incompetence uh, the more arrogant somebody is and the more sure of themselves they are and the less qualified they are, it's the funniest formula. And I have this uh, this friend in Utah I grew up with. Like the guy, he thinks of himself like an 11 or a 12, just as an individual. He has the best taste in food, the best taste in music, the best taste in cars, the best taste in clothes. But the reality is he's like a one in all of these categories. Like he chooses poorly on almost every aspect of his life. But he, he's, he, you can't ever knock him down. He's got this attitude where he's always a 12. Uh, and that's, that's when it becomes funny. So t t with The Room, Tommy Wiseau, uh, I've seen The Room probably 20 times in theaters. I saw it when it was like first uh, becoming a phenomenon. And Tommy was showing up to every single screening in Los Angeles. And I remember one time he did, I went to the, I, I believe it was the seven-year anniversary of The Room. He gave out like Frisbees and footballs and things like that. Uh, and he did a Q and A with the audience, and he wants to he wants to seem like he's in on the joke, uh, but he's not. He really does like he's trying to own it now. He's saying, "Oh yeah, I made this dark comedy, and that's what it was intended to be." It's like, no, it wasn't, because I remember even during the Q and A, someone asked him, "Like, uh, hey Tommy, what are you, <laughs> what are you? Um, oh yeah, there's there's a moment in the movie in the room where there's an inconsistency." Uh, where he and his friend Mark were best friends for seven years, and then he misspoke and said four years, like I think two other times in the script in the movie. So when he welcomed everybody for the seven-year anniversary for The Room, he said, welcome to the seven-year anniversary of The Room, and somebody from the audience shouted, four, and everybody laughed except for Tommy, and he stands there for a beat, and he goes, no, seven, and and... It, like he didn't, he didn't even get. You like, got the live reference. performance of the room. <laughs> yeah, it was it was insane. And then and then somebody asked him like, "Hey Tommy, what what are your three words for life? Like, what three words would you use to just like you know your your message for life?" He goes, "Happiness, success, and have fun." <laughs> like there was just some some something pure about Tommy's level of, um, and you know he's like he's one of those characters too. He's just you can't knock him down. Yeah, it's it's crazy that you got to be there for that, uh, and and it must have been surreal watching the whole thing in the movie that that came out, the uh, the James Franco movie. How did that sort of compare being there in that room with Tommy and sort of watching it as it's happening and feeling like you're sort of like in this 1969 Woodstock scenario, and then seeing like 20 years later, you know, the fictionalized version of Woodstock. Right. So it, it, this was that's a great example of a scripted comedy versus an unexpected, uh, you know, the, the, the weird, goofy, bizarre, badly made movie. So so it was a very competently made movie, but it had a story and it had a story arc. Um, you followed your characters. You it had a happy ending, and uh, you know, the characters kind of learned something by then. It's a very formulaic Hollywood movie. It's competently done. I enjoyed it. I thought it was a fine movie, but I enjoyed it for entirely different reasons than I enjoyed The Room. The Room is deeply, deeply funny on so many levels because on some level, it's a commentary on this man's view on life and humanity. Like the way that he's written the dialogue in The Room is, is a commentary on how he thinks people interact. And it is very wrong. Like he's he misses the mark almost entirely. Like people don't interact that way. It's very bizarre. It's it's so it's more like a very interesting and I think unintended view into a, a way a man thinks. And the only other time you see like really deep meta type commentary or meta type uh, uh, I guess entertainment like that is in Charlie Kaufman films. I really enjoyed Charlie Kaufman like adaptation. You can hear the narrator writing you know and his new movie came out what's it called i think i'm gonna end it all 
it has you know, a lot ending of things i think it was very, it's like almost bizarre to a fault but uh you can you can almost hear the writer's voice and tommy has that in the room you can hear the way he thinks yeah and it opens with this awkward sort of sex scene that goes you know a, a little overboard and and there's one thing i wanted to ask you because you know working in production and sort of you know, learning about different filmmakers and the history of, of all of them being obsessed with it. There's a sort of thing of with, you know, top top of the line directors. Uh, I think it started in like the 60s or 70s where they all want to make the, the art house porno. That's sort of like the dream to sort of make that art house porno with movies like The Last Tango in Paris, you know, where, where it's sort of how much sex can we get into a movie and not have it be porn, have it be art. Uh, they did it with Caligula, and now we sort of see it in TV shows where you watch something on HBO, like Game of Thrones or, or Spartacus that was out, where you're watching a scene and then it just breaks into like a sex scene that's maybe 20 seconds too long. What are your thoughts on on that sort of, you know, the, the art house porno, is it necessary or is it just, you know, people with too much power wanting to throw too many titties onto the screen? I I think that it might have something to do with the fact that it's so hard to produce that kind of stuff and so taboo that sometimes sometimes editors you know what or directors sometimes when they're sitting in the editing room are reluctant to cut that kind of stuff because it's almost like this crown jewel like we we've, we've built up so much expectation around this like you know sexual scene that we created in the movie it's a, it's a pain in the ass. You have to have a closed set. You have to have the actors sign off on it. You pay them more. It's a big deal. It's a big leading up to it. It's almost like a great analogy for sex itself, like the you know losing your virginity is this big event that we all hype ourselves up for. And then it finally happened. It's like, all right, well, it's fine. <laughs> it's no big deal. But in movies, I think we, we treat it the same way. It's almost like the sacred thing. So as soon as you have it, you keep all of it in there and you're reluctant to cut it. Whereas if you look at it objectively, like a robot or a machine or an animal who is not invested in human sexuality, you can just be able to say, okay, that scene's not working, let's cut it. But to cut a scene like that after all the hard work and you know the releases and stuff, you're more reluctant to, to cut something like that once you've already shot it. Uh, and I've been on sets before where there's been sex scenes and nudity and stuff like that. And it's, it is a big, it's a whole ordeal. It, like production shuts down for the day, except for that one scene. Oh, it's super awkward. Yeah. Anytime even there's not even sex, just nudity on set, yeah. it, it's super awkward, uh, especially since, like you mentioned, you know, losing your virginity where you're, you're in this sort of controlled, hopefully controlled environment, uh, as opposed to a cold set with, you know, these lights on you and, and a creepy sound guy, you know, with the boom right over you. It, it's, it's just, unless the movie really calls for it, you know, I, I feel... I feel it, it's not necessary for for movies, which is, I mean, obviously there's movies where you need sex. I can't imagine Eyes Wide Shut without, you know, that, that famous scene. Uh, right. But it's it's that fine line. And I, I just, I remember I was sitting in a meeting once and I hear these producers talking. They're like, oh, this is my dream to make the art house porno. And when I heard those two terms, art house and porno, I'm like, you know, someone's giving you too much money. That's probably what's just <laughs> happened right there. You also were very passionate about James Bond. You, you've had a few rants about this. And I'm a huge lover of the James Bond series. I think a lot of people are. Uh, but you sort of turned. You said you love James Bond and then something happened where now this character, which sort of fits the Maddox you know, template of kicking ass and slapping ass, is sort of no longer on your A-list. And I really want to know, what was it that sort of triggered that change in opinion? Yeah, that's a good question. So I was, yeah, I'm still a fan of, like, James Bond in general. But, like, when the Daniel Craig movies came out, that's when it kind of flipped for me. Because there's this movement in Hollywood, and I don't know if it's it started in the comedy scene, but I did a lot of improv in, in Los Angeles. And a lot of the theaters have this philosophy towards comedy. And I don't know if it's Hollywood influencing comedy or it's comedy influencing Hollywood, but it's to keep things grounded. And that's the note you keep hearing in, in pitches with studios and production houses, 
uh, comedy scenes everywhere, people are saying, keep it grounded, keep it crown keep it real, is what they like to say. So they don't like high concept things. They don't like Sas you're not gonna see a Sasquatch comedy coming out again. Like in the in the eighties you had uh what's the name? Uh, Harry Harry and the Henderson video, John Lithgow. Yeah, and then you had like E. T. You had Vicky, uh with small wonder, the little robot girl in the family. Like every every sitcom had a gimmick, like a high concept gimmick. And then in response to that, the pendulum swung so far the other way that now we got to keep everything grounded. And then you got the Daniel Craig films where he's kind of like a guy and he's kind of a spy. I don't, I don't get a sense that there is this really, this rich fantasy, high tech gadgetry world that James Bond comes from. Like James Bond is basically this invincible dude uh he has he's able to get out of every situation he's the biggest womanizer and everything daniel craig is a very competent actor i had no problem with that but the movies themselves man uh i really really hated um the one where oh uh quantum of solace yeah. really hated that one um because i looked into the story and i was like why didn't i like this movie what was so bad about it and i realized that the story is basically James Bond is attacking this villain, the supervillain, whose entire goal is to take over the water supply of a small country and then charge them a little bit more. Uh, so it turns out that's based on a true story. And the actual story, like in James Bond and Quantum of Solace, he's only raising the amount of money by like 10%. But the real story, it happened in Bolivia. And the, the guy like raised it by 50, 50 to 100%. So the real story is is worse and crazier than this than the stupid James Bond version that they toned down. Like, let's start there. That you're you're taking a real life story and making it more boring and more dull. I hated it so much. Um, I hated almost everything about it. I hated the symbolism. Man, I got there was a girl I was talking to um, on a dating site, and I I could tell as soon as she said this, we're not. It's not going to work out. I I didn't follow up. We haven't talked since. She told me how much she loves symbolism. And she says that everything is symbolism. You have to have symbolism in movies. I said, why? She goes, because it, it needs to mean more. I'm like, why does it need to mean more? Why do, why do you have to trick your audience with little, oh, do you know that cross mantle? Do you know what that little triangle? Who cares? That's like for, um, you know, the, the movie the movie sleuth, the nerds who are gonna go pour through frame by frame, like, oh, they, they made, that was a reference to the old movie. Like, great, those things are fun. But they don't, they're not the story. They're not the meat and potatoes. You gotta, you gotta tell the story, get in there, have a competent vision and express it that way. The symbolism is is just this kind of like a jerk off thing that I think movie people do for each other. Yeah, it's sort of like in the 80s where if your, you know, metal album, if you spun it backwards, it didn't, you know, have some sort of satanic lyrics, then it just wasn't a good record. Forget about the actual songs, you know, you need to have that sort of underlying thing. Yeah, it is right. true where in the 80s there was sort of more experimentation and now it's sort of like they're afraid to do something wild and wacky. And I mean, exactly. my, mind first, yeah, exactly it, my mind first goes to, you know, obviously Hollywood needs to start doing more cocaine. That definitely seems to be the X factor here. Uh, and my, I, I agree with you, by the way, because I love James Bond and I think Daniel Craig is an awesome actor. I don't think the issue is with him. I think it's sort of like what happened with Batman, where it worked with Batman, what Christopher Nolan did. But James Bond went from being this charming sort of head in the clouds kind of guy to, and when I say head in the clouds, I don't mean he's aloof. I mean, his sort of life is very floating. He goes from location to location, adventure to adventure. It went from that to a sort of very moody type of angry vengeance filled James Bond. He became like Bruce Wayne trying to get revenge uh, on his murdered parents to clean up the world for that. And you see yeah. that with Casino Royale and, and the sequel, which uh, was Quantum of Solace. The whole point of that mission was he he wanted to get back, you know, for killing the woman he loved. And I'm like, that that's not really why you watch a James Bond movie. You don't want to see someone who's that upset for two hours. You want to see someone who really doesn't care about anything besides having a good time and getting the bad guy. And I think that's sort of what they lost with, with those movies. Uh, and I don't know if it's going to swing back in the other direction. I mean, I, I personally think pendulums, like you said, always swing. So eventually I think there's going to be a James Bond again who's going to not care about, you know, being canceled on Twitter. Yeah, I think it'll swing back the other way. I remember there's one scene, I think, in Quantum of Solace, 
and this just pissed me off. Um, he was trying to get some intel on the bad guys, and he I remember he walked he was like in a dock somewhere. And he walks up and he just like casually strolls over to where these bad guys are are from a distance and like listens to them with his ear. Like, okay, this is literally just like detective work. Okay, cool. James Bond is not a detective. Yes, he is. He's a spy. He's a he's a world class agent. And sometimes you do that kind of stuff. But do we need to have that realism? Do we need to have that scene where he's just like, oh, I'm gonna go do some police work? No. Give us the give us the gadgets. Give us something. Give us like some some risk or some something at stake because otherwise you're just watching a guy listen to guys, yeah. which is what we're doing as the audience member. Yeah. He's doing the yeah. same thing we're doing. He's, he's going to use his gadget. He's going to put a plastic cup to the door to listen to the other side. Of <laughs> I would honestly like, like, I would honestly love if James Bond did that. At least that's something, you know, he's like, yeah. all right, he's doing his work a little he bit. He just shows up with some Dixie cups. He's like, here, go to, go to Bolivia. <laughs> Yeah, a listening dish, something, man. I love, I love gadgets in, in uh, spy movies. Movies in general, I mean, have changed the way the delivery of them is. We went from a culture of you wait for a movie's release in the movie theater, it becomes an event, uh, to everything is sort of at home now. You know, I personally think that's going to swing back. Also, I think, I think people want to see you know, movies in theaters. I think the issue is not the theaters. I think it's pricing. You know, when you go to a movie, it's not supposed to cost twenty five dollars. It, it should cost under 10 bucks. It's just something you go and do on a regular basis. But because it's changed to sort of this Netflix, you know, Amazon Prime culture, iTunes culture, you also don't learn about movies the same way as you used to. It's not like, okay, you watch, first of all, no one's really watching like NBC, ABC anymore, where you wait for the new trailer for a movie and it's like, okay, hey, that's coming out on this date. That's when I'm going to go watch it. Now everything's sort of like floating and random and you almost only find that about movies after the fact, after they've come out, it's like, oh, there's this hot movie on Netflix where there was sort of no buildup. No one's waited for six months, nothing on, you know, boards or anything. How do you, you know, how do you sort of look for movies now compared to, you know, obviously a passionate subject for you compared to how you used to sort of wait for, you know, the the summer season, the Oscar season in, in the fourth quarter and, and so on? Yeah, I think the same way most of us do now, which is social media buzz. Any, anything that gets enough buzz around it, I'm going to probably see just because it becomes a, a a cultural flashpoint. You have to, like everybody's talking about it. You have to see it. You have to talk about it, um, which is no big deal. Like, it's what I do. Uh, and then the other thing is like little, uh, oh, YouTube. YouTube, YouTube communities, YouTube people who, you know, make commentary videos on movies and things like that uh red letter media those guys um are great and uh your movie sucks and some of these other people who, who comment on movies they have a point of view that is very in line with um their audience members and so you can resonate with what they're saying and check out the movies that they recommend also little communities online like pulp fandoms i guess like people who are just really invested in these little communities uh because the type of movies that i like are sometimes these weird japanese movies that are like you know this crappy horror movie that came out of japan uh that has like a, a a cult following and you don't really hear about it except for these like little communities of people who are really invested in shitty horror movies um finding one of those gems is so rewarding because it could be years before hollywood picks it up and of course hollywood will pick it up and make an adaptation and you get like the the, the james franco the room uh <laughs> which is like which is fine, but you want to also watch the original, which is uh, just an experience in and of itself. Yeah, the horror genre in particular has this crazy following because I'm in involved in a lot of like Facebook groups and all that for for different movies to, to sort of keep my finger on the pulse of what's coming. And usually with a lot of groups, you'll have a mix of like the mainstream and then the sort of deep cuts. With the horror rooms, it's sort of like, give me the deepest cut you can find, you know, like, I know someone who loves horror movies. He's like, Friday the 13th, I'll refuse to watch it. Give me like Friday the 13th part five. Like I want to see, I want to see the stuff that everyone else sort of shies away from. Uh, and, and that's one genre in particular that I just never really got too into because for me, a movie is about that story of you don't know where it's going to go for the next two hours. And if I'm watching something like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I'm like, okay, you have this group of people. It's just a question of who's going to die and who's going to live to the end. 
So if it's just a matter of who's going to die or who's going to live, what's the actual story, you know? And, and I don't know, it, how, how are your thoughts on sort of that genre? Horror as a genre? Yeah. I the whole it. thing. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I think it's great. I mean, I'm literally wearing like an army of darkness shirt. Uh, as we're, well, that's as different. We're... That's Sam Raimi. Sam Raimi's a little <laughs> different. He, he, he sort of, I think he's one of the first that sort of added that level of humor to it. Uh, first with Evil Dead, and then when he got the money to make Evil Dead 2, they're like, you know what, let's just let's just go fully in that direction. And and obviously, Army of Dead, which he wanted to do as the sequel to Evil Dead, but he came to them with this concept. And they're like, no, let's just remake the first one, but with a budget. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so Army of Darkness, um, the, the character in that one, I, I think is very much like the other type of character I like, which is, so I said the first one was arrogance and incompetence, and then Army of Darkness is arrogance and competence. So both of those <laughs> both those characters really work uh, because that's very much Ash is very headstrong in the in the movies. But yeah, the horror genre itself, I think, uh, man, it really you see so much creativity and so much experimentation. All those high concept movies that I miss, you get to see some of that stuff in in horror movies because yeah, what let's explore what this what the world would be like with this monster in it or this killer. I, I prefer like, you know, bigger monsters, sci-fi type stuff, um, ghosts, paranormal stuff, weird stuff, things that are unsettling, things that you don't normally see. And I, I have strong opinions on different, I guess, trends in horror, like hereditary. Um, it was just two hours of being uncomfortable, I feel. And I remember watching it in theaters and everyone just felt uncomfortable for hours at a time. And it's like, it's almost like, you want you you're waiting for that release where it's like something's got to happen so that, that I don't feel this way anymore and the movie ends. <laughs> yeah. uh, I thought it was a fine movie and then the other you know there was there's one thing I really really didn't like about Hereditary though is that the entire third act the entire like ending to the movie everything is pinned upon one scene that flashes on screen for about 20 seconds maybe maybe 20 25 seconds at tops. And it's they're trying to explain who the bad guy is, who this uh, uh, what's a guy, what's the guy named King 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 Damon or or something Paimon Paimon. They're trying to explain who this King Paimon is, the bad guy in the movie. And the way they do it is by having the character, the the, the protagonist in the movie, literally pick up a book, open to the page of King Paimon, read a passage, and it's not even read out loud. It's just shown on screen for like twenty seconds. Boom, that's it, done. If you missed it, if you blinked, if you got up to like take a sip of water, the entire third act won't make sense. They don't explain it again. They don't mention it again. They literally just say, and now here's some text explaining what's going to happen. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> so you know they definitely filmed that afterwards. They're like, we're going to need 20 seconds to drop somewhere in this movie so it all makes sense for, for everyone. If you were going to make a movie, what would you make? I love, I love giant monster movies. I love like a Godzilla kaiju style movie. I like um, UFOs. I like the big budget Independence Day style movies. Those are a lot of fun. Um, but you can do, I, I don't think that there's been a movie like that that's been done so well that people take seriously. Uh, I think the last one was probably, oh, was that M. Night Shyamalan one that people, uh, Signs, I hated it. Um, <laughs> but it was yeah. kind of like- I'm getting like yeah. flashbacks to decades ago where you said <laughs> aliens decided to go to the planet that's covered almost entirely with the thing that's most harmful to them water yeah yeah that, that i loved time. signs loved signs when i read that i'm like well i'm never gonna be able to watch that movie again the same way yeah um and then prometheus was was such a such a cataclysmic disappointment for me i was so excited to see prometheus it's so beautifully shot like that movie just every shot is just art but um man i really hated prometheus i i feel like I feel like people sometimes get too, I guess, I don't know, full of themselves and they think that they're making, you got to have some fun with these movies too. Like Prometheus, I, I, I started writing a video and then one of my friends discouraged me from finishing it, but it was basically the movie Prometheus uh, had a lot of problems in it and you could fix almost every single problem in the movie with one line of dialogue. That's it. Uh, like, for example, people rightly criticize the movie where these astronauts land on this alien planet and 
they immediately take off their masks because they say the oxygen, the air is breathable. Everyone had a problem with that because there's microbes and things like that. You can get, it's not what scientists would do. Just on a basic level, a kid knows this, right? You fix that scene with one line of dialogue and the line of dialogue is this. Boop, boop, we scanned it. There's no microbes. Take, take off your mask. Like just a little bit, you know? And that's what sci-fi movies used to be going back to like 2001 where it was all about the tech where it's, not showing people it's showing a computer doing something and incorporating that aspect of it and and i mean my issue with prometheus and i also was looking forward to because i love ridley scott and i love alien i felt like the whole movie was a prologue like the whole movie is sort of you're waiting for something to happen and then it ends and it's like so pretty much i just had to watch this movie because you wanted to make another movie which i liked even less and at that point it's it's like oh i'd rather just watch alien (laughs) <laughs> right yeah i oh so here's here's something that um you know movie people will find kind of interesting and probably infuriating i watch movies out of order um i watch the sequels first usually and not not intentionally sometimes intentionally now i do but uh, at first like i hadn't seen what's the shrek the shrek movie i hadn't se- i still haven't seen shrek one uh or shrek two but i saw shrek three and I loved it. I thought Shrek 3 was great. And everyone's like, wow, that's the shittiest one. And I was like, well, I have nothing to compare it to. Same thing with Mission Impossible. I saw Mission Impossible 4, uh, or not Mission Impossible, Die Hard. I said Die Hard 4 before I said Die Hard 3, Die Hard 2, Die Hard 1. I enjoyed Die Hard 4. If you take Die Hard 4 out of a bubble, don't call it Die Hard 4. Call it Action Movie of the Summer. And you have just, you know, uh, uh, Justin Long and, and uh, uh, oh, man, I'm blanking blank on the main actor. What's his name? Bruce Willis? Bruce Willis. Yeah, Bruce Willis. <laughs> yeah, Bruce Willis and Justin Lyon. Remember, it's like side actor. Um, you put those guys into a movie. You make that summer blockbuster movie. It's a good It's a good movie. It's competent. It's so fun. I enjoyed it because I had nothing to compare it to. Everyone said it sucks because the first one was so much better. Well, I watched them in reverse order, and I finally watched the first one last. And, it, and every single movie I watched kept getting better. So I enjoyed this shitty part four. And I enjoyed part one, and I realized everybody, everything everyone was saying is true. Part one is way better, but I still enjoyed part four because I didn't have anything to compare it to. Same thing with the Aliens movie. I saw Aliens 4, then I saw Aliens uh, 2 and Aliens, or Aliens 3 and Aliens 1, and I enjoyed all those movies in that order because they get better, not worse. So watch them in reverse order. You're not going to lose anything. No, I definitely not want to go and watch like the 30 Police Academy movies in reverse <laughs> order. By, by the time I get through all of those, like I'll never be able to watch another movie again. I have the godfather, <laughs> you know, of of Police Academy movies. Yeah, that, it's, it's funny you mentioned where if you don't, if they didn't name it Die Hard, if they just released it as sort of this summer action movie, I do feel it would have done better. Uh, and And there is this fear now of sort of, like we've talked about it before, experimenting with movies where it has to be a sequel. It has to be a part of a universe. It has to be part of something because otherwise people aren't going to like it. But they're still not succeeding because they're putting out these sequels and all people are doing are saying, well, it's a disappointment compared to the, the original. Sure. I, I think part of it, it has a lot to do with um, the way budgeting works in Hollywood. People need to turn a profit on these movies. So... You know, people forget the business part of show business. They are trying to... So my own experience, like, writing... I've written for some stuff in Hollywood, like TV shows and movies. I punch up movies and pitch things. And I realized something that is really difficult with every single person who's trying to create a movie or something in Hollywood, which is you have to justify to them why they should invest in you, right? So don't look at the movie studios as people who want to make movies because... As much as they say they do, they don't. They're interested. It's almost like a bank, right? Mm-hmm. So you're going to this bank and you're sitting down with them and they're saying, okay, why should we loan you this money? What is the business proposition that you're offering us? And you say, well, here's my business idea. Here's my business model. And the business model here is the movie that you're going to make. Well, if your business model is going to be based on an existing franchise, that will reassure them that, okay, well, at least there's a bit of a fan base here, a pre-existing fan base that they're going to support this product. We'll probably see a return on our, on our investment. As much as people love movies, and when it comes to you know a $90 million budget or a $100 million budget, if you're the investor and that's your money on the line, do you really want to take that chance on some guy who's unproven and has this high concept movie? I mean, you that's where you start to see the clash of like real world finances and money 
and the vision that the person wants to make. And I think that's why we're seeing less creative stuff partly is because nobody wants to take a chance. Nobody wants to gamble. Yeah. Even, even if it is Bruce Willis involved, I mean, we're, we're sort sure. of seeing, you know, the last gasp of the, the movie star era where, where actors used to, you know, an actor's face used to sell a movie. And now that's really not the case. You know? Yeah, that's right. There's, there's no actor who's, strong enough these days that can just carry a movie on their own i think I mean, DiCaprio who, who was the that... last i think he's the last of the, like the big movie stars who who is dicaprio leonardo dicaprio oh dicaprio yeah i think he's yeah. sort of that last of that era where it's you know you people wait it's like oh dicaprio is doing another movie i don't know sort of who's coming up after i mean again i think i think that end of you know when avengers endgame came out i think sort of Robert Downey Jr. hanging it up and all those actors getting older. After a certain point when you see, you know, a gray-haired Robert Downey Jr. in an Iron Man suit, at some point it's going to shatter that that fantasy. And, you know, with everything that's just in general happening, we're sort of living in like this late 60s type period. I think when reality becomes crazy outside of your window, you become more interested in in those types of stories as opposed to, you know, the superhero stories. And what's wild is you mentioned that everything sort of has to be rooted more in reality. With James Bond, they sort of got rid of a lot of the gadgets, but now I'm seeing Daniel Craig doing parkour. I'm like, there's no way this dude is running out there, you know, swinging off these cranes and all that stuff. Uh, where it, now if they almost had him with crazy gadgets, I mean, we live in this digital era. I think it would always almost be more rooted in reality of just having him with all these scanners and you know, putting yeah. on glasses and seeing people's thoughts coming out of their head and stuff like that. The Daniel Craig movies seemed very much influenced by the Bourne identity movies. And um, Bourne movies are a different type of action and suspense and espionage and stuff like that. It's not it's not James Bond. And they tried, to, I think they were influenced a little bit too much by Bourne because Bourne moved the needles uh, so far in a different direction. They thought, well, we have to be that now. Um, and and with uh, with with big actors that can carry movies like that, I was thinking, I was trying to think like who would that be today? It's probably Harrison Ford. Uh, Harrison Ford can sell movies. Tom Hanks, um, Tom Cruise, and and you know, bless him, Tom Cruise at his age, he's still doing all his own stunts. I saw this stuff they're shooting for what is it, Die Hard Seven or something, or uh, not Die Hard Seven, uh, Mission Impossible Seven. Is that what it is? Yeah, I mean, I don't know which one in the series, but uh, it's, yeah. it's one of the Mission Stop Impossible Stop. movies. Yeah, yeah, something like that. And he's like running his motorcycle off a cliff and parachuting. I'm like, cool. All right, no matter what this is, whatever it is we're watching, this is cool. It's, and it's the actual Tom Cruise doing it. So, um, yeah, there's very few actors I think who can still sell a movie just based on their name. Yeah, and he's over fifty. You compared him to like Robert Mitchum when he was fifty, who now probably looks, you know, like. Like, he could play a great-grandfather. That's something also that's really changed where... And I You see it all the time, like, the memes where people just used to look older when they were younger. Yeah. Uh, a lot of those... I mean, I don't know what the heck Tom Cruise is doing, but there's something that he's not aging, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a few celebrities who are like that where you just always think of them as this... They always look the same. You it's wait, like, you well, wait for when they're going to go over that cliff where it's like, okay, you look 30, 30, 30. Oh, now you look 80. Yeah, yeah. Um, Bill Murray's starting to age a little bit. Oh, there's another one. Bill Murray. I think yeah. I don't see anything Bill Murray's in. Uh, and then certain directors like Wes Anderson. If you like his movies, some it's very controversial, I guess. I didn't even know that the people hated his movies so much, but <laughs> Wes I think they're fine. Yeah. Wes Anderson, it's funny because they're all sort of similar, but there's still like this Wes Anderson movie, like, I love The Life Aquatic, which I know a lot of people are, you know, debate over. For me, I love that one. But then I'll watch, you know, something else that he's done, and I'm just not a fan. And it's funny because stylistically, they're all so similar. So it's just like, is he covering subject matter that I find hysterical? And I love the whole Jacques Cousteau thing, which is why I love sort of The Life Aquatic. But then he did, uh, what was it, Moonlight Kingdom? And I didn't like, where it's like, ah, I'm not too interested in, you know, kids' camps. So... You know, it, it is funny how someone with even this one style can still have movies that people can can sort of debate and argue over. I didn't realize he yeah. was just in general, you know, hated and all that stuff. Yeah, I I, I really I liked um, Royal Tenenbaums was great. Yeah. Uh, 
yeah, I didn't like Moonlight Kingdom like you. I, I was not a fan of that one. I really, really hated Fantastic Mr. Fox. Um, I thought it was so boring. And <laughs> like it was just an animated movie that didn't need to be animated. A lot of dialogue. A lot of dialogue. Um, I found it weird. Tarantino, so, I, I, I found the Fantastic Mr. Fox weird in the sense that characters are trying to like emote on screen, but you're not seeing it through the sort of whatever claymation or stop motion that they're doing. Right. Like you don't get that emotion. You don't get that expression off their faces. I don't care how much they move like an eyebrow, you know, it just, it doesn't play the same way. Yeah. You might as well not have those amazing triple A actors doing those voices. Yeah. Uh, Quentin Tarantino is another one where, um, you know, some of his movies are hit and miss. I really like Quentin Tarantino in general, but he does this thing where he just needs to get over his himself with his dialogue. Like um, the Grindhouse movies that, that came out that he made with um, uh, Robert Rodriguez. The, yeah, Robert Rodriguez. So Quentin Tarantino, like obviously he has a lot of love for film. It, it just oozes through everything he does. He loves film and he's, he's bringing back like all these old things that have been forgotten, like old, 60s um you know like disco japanese disco music and stuff like it's like weird and it's so fun to watch spaghetti westerns all that stuff he brings that stuff back but he also loves to do these long dialogue scenes where it's just their characters talking for a monologue for i don't know like 10 minutes and there was one of those in the, in one of in his grand house movie the, the one with the car mm -hmm. um, in the diner and, yeah the diner scene and i'm like this is just it's tarantino for sure but it's not it's not really, it doesn't belong in this genre and it's a different style of movie that I don't necessarily like. <laughs> yeah, I was obsessed with Tarantino like all, you know, at the time young filmmakers were where it's like, that's the greatest type of filmmaking ever. Everything has to look sort of like Pulp Fiction. And it was when I was watching uh, his, his you know, entry into to Grindhouse, Death Proof, in that diner scene where he kept bragging how it's all one shot. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. everyone can tell it's one shot because they're so bored by the scene. They're paying mm -hmm. attention to the cinematography. When people are paying, like you mentioned symbolism, if people are paying attention to the symbolism on the screen, the cinematography, the lighting, that means they're not paying attention to the movie. And that's right. when I'm like, oh, now I see everything that he's doing in every movie. And it just like broke that sort of mirror for me. And after that, I like just hated him until he came out with uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where I felt was the first time he's sort of dealing with characters that have issues and emotions. And it's not just this sort of, you know, because Tarantino in some ways is like a Kevin Smith type filmmaker where he created this view askew universe, but just in his sort of ultra violent style. Yeah, that, that one shot thing, I'm glad you mentioned. So that is something that just drives me nuts. It, it falls in line with the same thing of symbolism. My criticism of the one shot thing that, that people love to, the, to brag about is it's just film people bragging for other film people. You know, it's like some, it's a director jerking off for his director buddies because they know how difficult a one shot is. Of course, a one shot scene has a lot of things that could go wrong. It's almost like setting up a Rube Goldsberg machine and when you get it off, it's like, okay, great, you did it. But did we need to, did, did that need to be one shot? There's very few movies I've ever seen them do that one shot thing where it's added anything to it. And I think, uh, what's that movie that came out, Birdman? Yeah, um, where the whole movie years ago, that is one shot or supposed yeah. to look like one shot. Most of it. I think there was like two or three cuts in the whole thing. But like that was, that added to it, that added to the frenetic energy. But when it's like one shot, and you're just rehearsing it over and over, and you finally get it right. It's like, great, you set up a Rube Goldberg machine. Who cares? Is this doing anything for the for the movie? Um, it's film school buddies just like kind of like elbowing each other and just saying, look yeah. what I did. I, I did this thing, right? Yeah, it's the art house porno. Which you know, if you're yeah, gonna do a long, boring one shot, it's got to end with an art house porno to have that sort of payoff. You know, reward also, the audience with some nudity. Yeah. All right, Maddox, I really enjoyed talking to you. It's something I've wanted to do for, for decades. Love your website. Love your work. Look forward to what you're going to do next. Uh, is there anything you have you have planned you're going to throw at us? Who are you better than now? Yeah, uh, <laughs> always kids and animals. Uh, kids and animals. Yeah. Um, so I, I've got so much stuff coming out. Like, I never really talk about the things I'm working on until they're done. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's because... Sometimes they don't see the light of day and it looks stupid to brag about something I'm working on that's not out yet. So 
I'm working on a lot of stuff. I'll, t- I'll just say this much. In the last three or four years, I've written, I've, I came out with a book, Fuck Whales, right? That's about 200 pages, but I've written probably about 800 pages worth of content. Uh, where, is the, where are those other 600 pages? Fuck That's sharks. like some of the stuff. That's the, the sequel. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of stuff I'm working on. Um, I guess I guess the, I'm really pushing my YouTube channel and Twitch lately. So I, I'm experimenting. Speaking of doing something just to entertain myself, I'm doing a Twitch stream where I hop on as a cowboy uh, or a banana. And it is such a bizarre thing that just kind of came about by accident during quarantine. That's a lot of fun. It's on uh, twitch.tv slash Real Maddox if you want to check it out. Please check it out. I know I'm going to follow. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you're all about that experimentation you're sort of a you know a pioneer the the mount rushmore of the internet of what it is now and thank you so much for for coming on and chatting with me about movies we love hate and and just generally don't understand thanks for having me this was a blast